ready to get started. Um, firstly, welcome everyone to the first session of our sem seminar series called Histories of Capitalism and Race in the Middle East and Indian Ocean. We're very happy that you could um, all join us today. Um, so this is hopefully going to be the first year um, in an annual seminar series tackling questions around capitalism and race from various angles and focusing um, as, we, as we go on um, on different time periods. Um, so we're thrilled to be starting out with Neda Mumtaz's fabulous book, God's Property. But before we get into a discussion of this, this book, we wanted to share with you, the three of us, um, we probably should have introduced ourselves. Um, so my name is Hengome Ziai. Um, I often go by Henny. I'm a lecturer in the history of the Middle East and Africa um, here at SOAS, and maybe my colleagues can introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Martin Biglari. I'm um, a postdoc in the history department here at SOAS, specialising in the history of the modern Middle East. And I'm uh, Sarah Kodzes. I'm a senior lecturer in the politics department, um, and I also work on the Middle East with a focus on urbanism and political economy. So wonderful. So we wanted to open up um, by sharing with you some of the intellectual um, sort of foundations or aims of this seminar series and for setting up this kind of space. Um, so as many of you will know, debates around histories of capitalism um, abound. And there are many, many seminar series sort of popping up everywhere. There's one at Harvard. There's one, is, uh, there's one at Oxford. So I suppose for us, the question is, what makes SOAS a distinct space for having these kinds um, of conversations. So what sets SOAS apart? Um, so firstly, we're not just invested in um, political economy, but specifically a critical and post-colonial reading of political economy and capitalism. And so for us, this really means an interrogation of the received and conventional uh, categories through which capitalism has been studied. So including land, labor, um, law, debt, um, and so on. So not only does SOAS have a unique concentration of expertise on these questions, but it all also foregrounds a critical approach rooted in the languages and epistemologies of the global South. Yeah, and I'll jump in to talk about why we have race in the title of our um, seminar. Um, so we think it's really important to study the question of capitalism concurrently with the question of race. For us, we are thinking about race in at least two senses. And you can push us towards more senses as the seminar keeps going. Um, first, we need to pay close attention to the way that processes of racialization, particularly forms of racialized labor like slavery and indentured servitude, have been foundational to capitalism and its violence, and not necessarily simply as its prehistory. Um, this has long been acknowledged in the context of the Atlantic world by scholars of racial capitalism, but we want to promote discussion about the merits and limitations of this framework in the Middle East and Indian Ocean studies. It's part of what this seminar is trying to do. A second, perhaps less obvious way in which we are thinking about capitalism and race is in the way that the very categories of our analysis are racialized. Another way of putting this is that whilst categories of political economy might seem neutral and universal, they never are, um, they derive from a Euro-Atlantic historical experience. For example, often presuming racialized conceptions of the quote-unquote human. As we'll see today, actually, with Neda's book really nicely, um, they center the human to the exclusion of non-human um, agents, forces, such as the divine spirits, nature, and so on. So the racialized baggage of our conceptual apparatuses in the social sciences is something we'll be paying close attention to um, with the aim of opening up and exploring other vocabularies and frameworks of understanding um, our world from the bottom up. Um, and as you might see from our lineup for the rest of the, the series, uh, we've attempted to challenge the regional silos that we've inherited by um, area studies, um, uh, by including texts on the Middle East and the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. together. Uh, we've also worked to unsettle disciplinary boundaries by inviting scholars who, who themselves take on really interdisciplinary approaches, which I think is really exemplified in today's uh, text, uh, including religion, anthropology, political theory, science and technology studies, um, history, and of course, uh, political economy. Um, temporally, uh, we've chosen books that focus on a key moment that is traditionally considered a transition 
to capitalism, but in fact uh, help us to challenge these kind of uh, diffusionist, universalist, and unidirectional narratives that we traditionally um, that have shaped how we've traditionally understood the history of so-called uh, the, the so-called history of capitalism. And note, we we've, we've chosen. Uh, the plural histories of capitalism for this very reason. But more than this, uh, our aim is to create a sense of intellectual community around these questions at SOAS and London more generally. And we're really happy that a lot of you have come from um, other universities in, in London. Um, we're excited to be hosting a new generation of scholars in our field, presenting their books, some of them for the very first time, which I think is the case today in person at least. Um, and at the same time, we also want to make sure that this is a non-hierarchical uh, intellectual space for us all um, to, to raise our points and questions, where student participation uh, is front and centre. And uh, interestingly, this seminar is actually running alongside uh, an MA module, uh, and uh, um, two of the students in the MA module um, will be um, presenting their reflections on, on the text. And finally, rather than a lecture format, uh, we're hoping to cultivate a space for a close reading and a deep engagement with the text. So discussion, questions, and feedback uh, will be vital to this. Uh, and we'll also ask our, for that reason, we'll ask our speakers to limit their talks to about 20 to 25 minutes, so shorter than your usual uh, seminar series uh, talk. Um, and then we'll have our uh, remarks from our postgraduate students. Okay. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our guest today, Nada Mumtaz, who is um, Associate Professor in the Department um, for the Study of Religion and in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. We're very honoured and excited to, to have you here today. Um, after a Bachelor of um, Architecture at the American University of Beirut, she received her PhD in Cultural Anthropology from the Graduate Centre of the City um, University of New York. Her research stands at the intersection of the anthropology of Islam, Islamic legal studies, studies of capitalism, um, and urban studies. And it spans the 19th and 21st centuries in the Levant, uh, with Beirut, Lebanon as her main research site. Her book, God's Property, um, Islam, Charity in the Modern State, was published in 2021. Um, she's excited about her forthcoming article in American um, Anthropologist, entitled, entitled Gucci and the Waqf, in alienability in Beirut's post-war reconstruction. Thank you. So. Um. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, uh, Henny and Mateen and Sarah, for having me. It's uh, really an amazing invitation. Last time, actually, I realized I gave a book author, a author meets critic session um, where there were two people in the audience, <laughs> so this is amazingly exciting. Um, I, I blame it on Lisbon's too nice of a you know place for people to come to the conference, but yes. <laughs> so thank you for being here, and um, thank you all to have read, those who have read, and I'm looking forward to the comments. Um, I will say that uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to be part of the series uh, named after no less than you know Walter Rodney and. Uh, I hope I can deliver something that's, you know, um, good enough <laughs> on histories of capitalism and race in, in the Middle East. And I will start by giving you a little bit on the story of the book because it talks to the theme of the seminar. Although I don't deal with race as much, uh, but I will, you will get more of that with some of the wonderful people lined up, uh, including Noor Fadila Yahya and Maryam uh, Hadi Davis. And so um, I will say that the book was an outcome of a you know, dissertation proposal that was very much centered on understanding religion and capitalism today in Beirut. I was thinking of studying the contemporary operation of waqf properties, and I'll tell you a little bit what that is, in Beirut, Lebanon, under a neoliberal market economy, and contrasting that with the 19th century practices which I was going to unearth from the archive. I was very much, uh, uh, you know, driven by the proposition of thinking about what kinds of markets existed in the 19th century, how are they different from those that are today, rather than thinking about it as a move from outside of capitalism to inside of capitalism. So talking to your question of this question of transition and trying to rethink it partly. 
Um, now, uh, just to give you just a, a, few, a bit of uh, background on what Wokf is, even though it's, it's a weird joke because the whole book is about deconstructing what Wokf is, <laughs> and so it's, it's about ch the changing conception of it, but uh, even though I'm going to defeat my own purpose, but I will, tell, I will start with one particular example about what is the, in the 19th century Beirut, uh, and based on Ottoman legal uh, canon, Wokf involves usually, well, but before I say that, I will say that since we're in, in the UK, a land trust would be the closest thing to a Wokf, so just to give you a sense. Uh, and so in the 19th century Beirut, it usually involves an immovable, an object that has a benefit that is dedicated in perpetuity to charity. Now founders take their ownership of that immovable and give it to God. And while they're entrust the administration of the wealth according to their own desires and wills and stipulations to an administrator. So as examples of wealths, there are certain things that are in and of themselves, you know, charitable. Like you can think of a mosque or a, a, a bread kitchen, these existed in Beirut, I'm giving you a, what I'm giving as example, or a Sufi lodge, or even trees, because, you know, shading passersby is considered, you know, an act of charity. <laughs> There's catwalks in other places of the world, we don't have one <laughs> in Lebanon, but, you know, feeding cats is also, a, you know, a, a, an act of charity. Uh, there's also attached to these and financing these institutions revenue producing uh, assets like shops and rooms and land. So you have both the objects that are themselves charitable and those uh, basically funding them. So, um, and just before I go on, I wanna say as a parenthesis that even though I focus on Islamic waqfs, in fact, and even though waqfs are defined in Islamic law, all communities, whether in Beirut Christians and Jews also use the waqf for a variety of charitable purposes, whether it is, you know, to create uh, support spaces for devotional practices, sustaining nuns and priests, supporting one's family, providing for the poor, etc. Now, um, so my intention uh, when I was thinking about Waqf is how can we think of capitalism while taking religion seriously? Um, I'll come back to that question towards the end of the my, my introduction, and because um, I think a lot of people were dissatisfied with a lot of Marxist kind of discussions of, you know, the and political economy that kind of sidelines religion as something that's, you know, superstructural, etc. Uh, there's other answers to that question, and I'll come back to them later. But uh, it comes back to, yeah, if we take religion seriously, how can we rethink our models of capitalism even? So for Wolfs, uh, this meant taking, religious ser taking religion seriously means taking the fact that people make waqfs as an act of piety, to be close to God, uh, to get rewards in the hereafter, as a serious thing, that people actually care about that. I need to say a caveat, which is to say that it doesn't mean that they are not doing that for other purposes as well. But the fact that I have to tell you that caveat, because somebody's going to tell me, but you know, waqf are also used for this and this and that, and you, you know, it, it, that, the fact that we think exclusively of something that has to be either self-interested or, you know, uh, truly altruistic is itself a reflection of our contemporary world, where we have, you know, capitalist markets, where we are maximizing individuals, where we operate only according to, you know, uh, self-interest, and then you'd have to have this other parallel sphere that's kind of untouched by these motives of self-interest, and that is, um, these usually kind of gifts. And so, and this is an, an argument that has been made by Jonathan Perry in a kind of a, a important article for me, which is called The Gift, the Indian Gift, the quote unquote Indian Gift. And um, it, it's a, it, yeah, so he makes that point there. And I think I faced it a lot when I was doing this research that if you start to put emphasis a little bit on the religious aspects of wealth, you, found your, you find yourself you know, challenged by people saying, well, but it's not just that. And of course, it's not just that. And I would say that Wokf itself pr provides a model where you can think of the worldly and the otherworldly or more, uh, as more enmeshed and not just either one or the other. <laughs> so that's kind of what I s headed out to study. And I hadn't realized basically that my object of study, the Wokf, had changed so much in meaning and practice. 
So when I came to Beirut to start and do the research, I started to encounter these wolves that I had never seen or read about in the studies of wolves that existed in the literature, which are mostly historical because there's a lot of assumptions that wolves kind of were eliminated almost in the 19th and 20th century with the modernizing states, etc. And um, so, um, so I found these wolves that were not at all objects. It was more like NGOs, you know, so they just kind of are a wolf to support human rights. It's like, why is this an Islamic wolf? <laughs> very bizarre. And, or the wolves for the fight for justice, you know, things that were very, very broad. And I realized that I really needed to better understand what wolf was today. And at first it was these, one of these interesting ethnographic moments where I would argue with my interlocutors and say, well, this is not a wolf. And they're like, why am I telling them that? <laughs> no, this should not be me telling them what wolf is. I should be, as an anthropologist, trying to understand how people today actually understand and practice this wolf thing. And so, um, so basically what I ended up doing is, try, is uh, basically having to try and understand the transformations of the wolf and what allowed for these new kinds of wolves that I was, I was kind of encountering. And before delving into the question of wolves today in the market, and particularly because some of them were not really involved in the market because they became now just NGOs that, you know, um, <laughs> they were not really anymore these uh, inalienable properties, the properties that cannot be sold and bought. Um, so what I came to realize also was that my two analytic categories, this question of religion and economy, religion and capitalism, that I was starting with, were themselves a product of historical processes that continue to operate today and attempt to make this complex social world to fit these categories, including the wolf. So basically, the story that the book ends up telling is the story of the remaking of wolf in the process of making the economy through its separation from religion, which is what Sarah kind of hinted at, which is to think about, you know, in the economy, there's, you know, only uh, we know how to calculate things. It's kind of all, uh, you know, uh, if you ask you know, modern economics, they, they, there's no space for God, even though somebody like Julia Eliachar will tell you, like, think about, you know, um, Adam Smith and the invisible hand of the market. I mean, if there is an invisible hand of the market, what is it but something supernatural, you know? Mm. So some people, some great anthropologists have done work to try and deconstruct our, the modern economic kind of theories as something that's just about these kind of rational uh, um, scientific uh, discourses that are separated from other things. But that, we'll get to that another time. But for now, um, so I'm I was saying that, you know, the separation of religion and economy um, so this story is one that would resonate, would resonate with scholars of religion and secularism, usually, because they are, although they are more focused on the separation of religion from politics. But of course, the separation is a, a part of a larger compartmentalization and secularization of the world and the making of you know, these different spheres as secularization theorists talk about. So to that kind of, to scholars of sec, I borrow from that kind of secularism studies, this thinking of the making of the world in different spheres and the privatization of religion and bring it in conversation with studies of you know, economy and capitalism. So I want to highlight three aspect of, aspects of the secularization of the wealth uh, and its reproduction around religion and economy. These are the main, three of the main things that I want to highlight for the talk today. One of them is the fact that, wealth, uh, that God ceases to be an actor an important actor in, in uh, wealth and property relations. And so I had, as I had mentioned, uh, in the Ottoman legal canon, um, the founder surrenders the ownership of an object to God. So the, God becomes the owner uh, of the wealth. And so there's many characters that are involved in wealth. There's the founder who's not the founder, who's not the owner anymore. There are the beneficiaries who receive, you know, income or bread or whatever from the wealth. Uh, there's then uh, administrators who rent it, and then there's God, who is the new owner. So now with new property regimes that were starting to be put in place, especially with the French mandate in Lebanon, which is, starts in 1920 after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, there was no space for God in, as an owner. Uh, one can see that in the French property registry, 
uh, where the process of registration, when the uh, surveyor would encounter a wolf, they had to put the name of an owner. So they couldn't put really the original owner because they're not the, really the owner. They're not gonna put the beneficiaries because they also do not really own it. They, they could not put the administrator because the administrator changes. And you know, God is not something they put there. So instead what they put is the wolf. So the wolf then transforms into this person who can actually own. So that's kind of a, a huge, I think, leap that is enabled by a very kind of inconspicuous moment of registration, but also, of course, enabled by a host of things around it, including new laws about, you know, a moral personhood that becomes possible. But you can also, I think, see it in these day-to-day -day, uh, things. So what we have is that God suddenly absconds from property relations. We are not thinking anymore of, you know, his presence and, you know, the fact that this is at the end dedicated to kind of getting closer to him, etc. And so um, the walk then becomes and its otherly rewards and its pious purposes are kind of obscured and it just becomes, you know, these people beneficiaries, etc. And that's it. So this brings me to my second point in this process of secularization and remaking of what along religion and economy distinctions, which is the separation between these rent producing um, walks, which I had mentioned the shops and lands, etc., and those that are considered religious walks. Uh, so indeed, this process of emptying God from property relations happens to certain walks, while others are considered actually religious, just religious. So, and I will say this is not my term. And when I say religious property and religious walks, I am borrowing from you know legislation from the French mandate. Uh, and so the preamble of a decree that organizes walks uh, starts with the following. And I quote, given that walks established by Muslims intending charity and piety have a purely religious Islamic character, they can only be administered by Muslims. They are like the religious private property of the Muslim community. So I will say that uh, the characterization of property as religious is not something I had seen in the Islamic legal tradition. And uh, it, you know, a question might arise in the Islamic tradition whether you know this act is a religious act. You know, prayer is a religious act. Whether, whether whereas other acts are pecuniary, they all have to do with transactions. And th this question arises a lot of the times about who can get to do these particular practices. So fasting, can a Christian fast or not, you know, these questions. And so what can, there's questions around that. It, since it's done to get close to God, is it supposed to be a religious practice or is it supposed to be, uh, you know, a, a worldly thing? And, um, and in, so in fact, that question of whether it's religious or worldly transaction comes up, but it's never thought of as this is a religious property. It is instead thought of, you know, like any other worldly action that is done with um, the proper intent, then becomes accrues otherworldly, uh, you know, uh, rewards. So people would give you an example, like, you know, if you smile to somebody with the intent of, you know, being a good Muslim, being whatever, you know, get, that counts as you know a good an act of, of charity as a as a good deed, and so you, you you see how transforming even like you know simple relations among people can be transformed into kind of religious acts, but by having the proper intent. So, for the French, however, using walks as and terming them religious serve a, serves an important purpose, which has to do with law, because the French divided laws in Lebanon between personal status law, which deals with marriage, divorce, etc., and realist, real, uh, uh, um, real status, so personal status and real status. And real status is what the French themselves were, um, you know, uh, legislating about uh, more broadly different transactions. And then for personal status, religious communities had actually legal sovereignty and they could actually uh, you know, govern their own supposed uh, personal status. So what happens when the waqf is, that is described as religious means, it means that it can be 
um, governed according to each com religious community's rules, which has, and I will say, explain, uh, actually has different effects, including starting to think of wolf as belonging to a certain community and the association of wolf with, with, with sects and groups, which is not something that used to exist actually in the Ottoman period where sometimes a lot of the wolves you know, were very much individual rather than attached to a particular community. Um, but characterizing wolves as religious property also meant submitting them to particular understanding of religion and economy. And so this is the third transformation in that secularization, which is the further distinction between truly charitable wolves, which are the ones that belong to religion, and those who are now the French think about as disguised. You know, they're like, oh, these Muslims, <laughs> they are doing things, just, you know, uh, trying to escape, uh, you know, inheritance law. They're trying to give, um, you know, charity to their families. This is really nepotism. This is not really about charity but they kind of disguise it as poverty, uh, as charity. And therefore, we have to basically, we ca they categorize these wolves dedicated to charitable purposes that they did not consider charitable, according to French conceptions of thereof, and um, consider them non-religious. Uh, non and basically, um, these new wolves that are dedicated, these wolves dedicated to families then become disciplines to the needs of the economy. And that's where, uh, you know, they have these, I give you just a fun quote because uh, the French are pretty amazing <laughs> at coming <laughs> up with like, you know, some racist stuff. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, they talk about their way, uh, sorry, they talk about their, uh, I'm not gonna read the racist <laughs> quotation here uh, because they talk about their, then we're not gonna go back to our ways of Algeria where things didn't really go well with the wolves and <laughs> a lot of rebellion happened, etc. So we're gonna be more sneaky and we're gonna work with some ulama and who are you know religious scholars and they will we will make them do the changes we want to do and then they will you know so they have these like very uh sneaky ways i mean they don't they can't compete with the brits we all know who the sneaky is but, <laughs> but they also have their own ways but anyways um and so so one of the quotes is um that they are aiming to modernize as much as possible and to adapt to needs the very special law of wolf uh, they aim to ensure the circulation of real estate property of the wolves, whose immobilization constituted an obstacle to the economic development of the country, to improve the administration and exploration, exploitation of the patrimony of the communities, and to make disappear certain institutions like the family wolf. So you can see how they're very much concerned with you know, real estate property markets and their particular ideas about how wolves were standing in their way, and they're trying to actually you know, create that you know, that economy where there is free market and poverty. Um, and so while certain walks ma were made religious and you can't, you know, these mosques, etc., are not going to be moved, you have other ones, family walks, that are actually made into not really charitable, not religious, and therefore we can put them in the economy and we can just, you know, bring them back to circulation. So these are the three main points I wanted to highlight about these transformations of the wolf and the attempts to kind of discipline them according to these ideas of religion and uh, uh, economy. And I will say that this doesn't mean that earlier conceptions of wolves were eradicated and that God doesn't come back into people's understandings and dealings with property. And this is why I suggest that the process of separating religion and economy and the production of, of wealth as either one of them is one that continues to happen constantly and that needs to be, it needs to be disciplined constantly and requires violence and politics and law. And I focus a lot on law, but in this new project I'm, you know, which is what I started with, which is the question of uh, you know, what I start to think about, which is the operation of wealth today in the market and the role of religion and understand on the unfolding of capitalism. Uh, I turn to my focus on the uh, walks in the reconstruction of Beirut city center in uh, between uh, after the civil war, Lebanese civil war, quote unquote, 1975 to 1990. Um, and again, my aim here is to move beyond the, que the question of does Islam and religion more generally affect capitalism? Because I think that this question in some ways requires a yes, no answer. You know, the Marxist one is religion as ideology. No, 
no effect on the economy, its structure. And in 1996, you know, uh, Maxime Rodinson in Islam and Capitalism exactly says that, in fact, no, uh, you know, uh, that, that's, there's no effect of religion. Islam is not really against, uh, is not, uh, doesn't hinder or um, encourage it. Whereas other answers to that question have proposed either, you know, that it hinders or develops capitalism. So, for example, Timur Kuran, who is who writes a lot about wolves and, uh, you know, comes with particular assumptions about what is our aim in this world that we all should move towards capitalism. I think he takes it a bit <laughs> for granted that, you know, the West has reached the best kind of uh, world we live in, but. Um, but I don't know what he does with other things, including global warming and all what we're living through, but that's where he stands. <laughs> uh, but he says, like, you know, some institutions of Islamic law have hindered the development of uh, capitalism. Whereas um, some geographers and anthropologists studying um, Islam and neoliberalism in particular will tell you that, in fact, no, Islam can be used as a way to kind of instill neoliberal subjectivities. And so they tell you, for example, how certain practices and virtues coincide with capitalist technologies of the self. The Islamic tradition can sometimes be adapted to market reason. Like, for example, ideas of productivity have been used by new preachers to kind of you know, talk about uh, that that's part of the qualities of a Muslim, for example. So um, that's been done, yeah. So. So what I tried to show in this new word, word is that wolves, you know, participate in neoliberal capitalist economy, and they are able to remain property regimes built on inalienability that provide friction to it. So this is not an aha moment where you can say, you know, the analyst kind of discovers that you know religion is really a cover for neoliberalism, and it's not either, or you know, or it's in cahoots with capitalism or neoliberalism. Nor is it a kind of a haven, you know, we're going to find in Islamic economics that it's going to kind of, you know, <laughs> resist capitalism. That, that is not what's going to happen. Um, so instead, it invites us to think more about the hybridity of both neoliberal capitalism and these religious others. And I know this is, you know, I'm throwing it in, in at the end, but I can, I'm happy to elaborate on that. So that's kind of where I want to end. And um, thank you for listening. Um, thank you so much, uh, Neda. Um, I'm going to invite uh, our two wonderful MA students to offer some of their uh, responses. I would urge the rest of you to start gathering your comments and your questions. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, we would love this to be a space um, for, for primarily discussion and sort of close engagement with Neda's ideas and, and the text if you've had a chance to um, take a look at it. Um, but in whatever order you'd like, um, John Michael and Bianca Maria, please uh, share your comments. Uh, okay, so maybe I'm thinking just because uh, my question kind of ties to uh, what you were discussing now, mm -hmm. um, which for me was probably one of the most interesting points because I'm not going to lie, this text was hard. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I wish that there was, you know, some picture here and there. <laughs> but um, there's one on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I found um, really interesting, like the conversation at the end of your book when you discuss maslaha, and uh, like I, I. I do, um, I'm studying now Islamic law, and I feel like maslaha is a very interesting concept, which is that of welfare, but also in um, Islamic legal um, theory is a methodology of, um, which comes from like this Quranic precept that basically states that uh, you can override the, um, uh, what is prohibited in the name of like public good and like public welfare. And um, like, I, I have to say, because I, I found that a lot of scholars are problematizing uh, the concept of maslaha when it comes to self-secularizing processes when it, in like Muslim majority countries. And I think like that's the case for the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, 
where uh, the scholar Hajarian and also Anaim make the argument that uh, it is through uh, this constant invocation of the state of exception, of overriding Sharia in the name of public welfare, in the name of public good, that triggers a process of self-secularization within the country. And I feel that you kind of like touch upon Maslaha and how that is also um, uh, making it so that the um, immobilization of the economy and of waqt is kind of overridden uh, through a process of, of, of maslaha, if I'm not wrong. So I don't know if you could potentially elaborate on this. Hopefully my question is not um, as hard as it might have come <laughs> for, but yeah. Do you, did you, do you want to? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, just thank you for coming here to give us this talk. Um, so I too, you know, had some struggles with this book. Um, <laughs> but I think what I think <laughs> good struggles. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what our discussion in class, um, I think my own personal kind of discussion um, when I was reading the book was it was I found it really interesting how walk um, and how you place walk as sort of straddling the line between these different concepts that we typically see as being uh, distinctly separate from one another um, and perhaps straddles not the correct word but more so that the fact that we view it as straddling these lines is a production um, and I think that um, how you sort of trace the views to it the views to walk you know the practice of it and um, sort of regulation of it through time and the subtle changes really helped me understand you know why that sort of viewing things as a process is really important. Um, and then I guess there's a question, uh, and one that we sort of got into class uh, was how the sort of broader framework of your, your analysis in the book, um, because you use the notion of architecture and grammar of Waqf as sort of core guiding uh, principles to how you wrote and how you thought about going about the history of Waqf and how it's used. Um, so first, we, if you could go into a little bit about how you came to that, you know, that decision to use those concepts and how you yourself see those concepts. Uh, no, easy question. Um, and then, uh, I guess in sort of that linguist turn, um, I wondered if you also saw the notion of grammar um, as being related to Chakrabarty's notion of translation. And that sort of gets back into what you were talking about, capitalism at the end in terms of, do you see the, the potential of seeing Waqf as sort of this pre-capitalist, pre-history of capitalism, or that you can use your notion of grammar and architecture to sort of pr um, provide a more enriching history of capitalism's, develop capitalism's development in the Middle East, and one that is not, that problematizes, you know, sort of normative notions of capitalism. Do you want to add anything? Then maybe oh. later, because it's a lot like for questions, I feel. Oh, like I mean, this, already... is, this is your chance to, you know, um, your remarks. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things that we, so today we had two hours of uh, seminar. And... You are ready for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, not really, because I feel like, you know, we complexified a, a lot of, um, uh, you know, this book kind of uh, really, like all the different questions, if anything, confused us or me at least even more. Um, Great. Yeah, very much. <laughs> like, um, what I feel that I'm not quite um, sure um, about is um, when you discuss, so in, in the part where you talk about the intent of charity, um, uh, Hengame here, she suggested that you're, you were problematizing the relationship between the, the inner dimension and the, the body, so like the body and mind and the Cartesian dichotomy. And for th like in, in that sense, I'm not too sure how um, that fits into this whole book if um but that's just me and my limitations as a master's student probably um so yeah that question and also i was 
generally interested to think of um, the the difference and the role of the the family waqf and the waqf when it becomes like depersonalized in some ways because uh, the first thing that I that I thought of when you were meant you were describing how like wax were um, passed on by families to like you know, circles of like kinship and just communities and like it sounded like very much like grassroots in that sense uh, whereas uh, obviously in the context of neoliberal in a neoliberal economy people had to you know go through the whole uh, classic uh, kafafos of uh, uh, applying for the job here and there so there is a, a dehumanization um, and so I I'm thinking a detachment from um, the kurba so the also the um, the um, you know, like the the process of getting closer to God in that sense. Um, so yeah, like for me, like I, I I feel I I would like to know how affect plays a role in these relationships, whether like the familial type of waqf and the de affectioned uh, waqf in uh, the modern nation states, if that makes sense. Yeah, and um, I just want to sort of add to that. So we've got we've got the rest of the members of the class in the audience, so they can also start sort of preparing their questions. I thought that those are really great reflections, actually. Um, and I just wanted to add to John Michael's point. So we did have a discussion in class about the relationship between architecture and grammar. So you know, if you could sort of articulate for us how you see those two frameworks um, interacting with each other, that would be really great. Yeah, I mean, perhaps I can start with that since that's yep. kind of a bigger, you know, uh, the way I've conceptualized it. Um, it. It's mostly me trying to deal with the fact that there's there has been a lot of change. So I'm trying to change the change the way people use walk differently. So there's too many different too many different moving parts is really the main issue. So you know, there's Muslims who are living and who are doing these walks, and then but there's also they are living under very different conditions. So they are living under, you know, an Ottoman state at first. And then, so because I'm doing a long durée that starts in 18, 1826 up to 2012 or, you know, 15, etc. And so I am trying to understand how Waqf has changed. And it's uh, grammar comes from, you know, Wittgenstein's idea of uh, uh, the use of the meaning of words in context. And so it is uh, of concepts in, in context. So it is not really grammatical rules as the way we think about them, you know, so this is not you conjugate this way, etc. But it's about you understanding the meaning of a word from its various uses. I, I sometimes give the example of my French teacher telling us we shouldn't look up words in dictionary. And uh, when we don't, uh, unless we really don't understand it at all, because when you just read them and get them from the context you get a better sense of them so that's kind of partly you know you want to think about the fact that you know you really get to understand these concepts from their use and so here is the same what i'm seeing is the same concept used walk but it is in a very indifferent context and its meaning has become different and so that's what you know muslims today are telling me they are doing off and i'm coming and telling them this is not well is is one of these places where i'm not really aware of what has happened to the context that has allowed for that meaning to exist so um so that con the the basically um in terms that um wittgenstein would use the architecture is what he would call the language game <laughs> And so it, but here, because I am talking particularly about a certain configuration of state and its relation to religion and politics and, uh, sorry, religion, yeah, and, and economy and, uh, and certain religious and, and certain communities. So these particular configurations are changing. So the relation between the state, an Ottoman state that is at the end an Islamic state, even though it's trying to also move towards different things during the Tanzimat, et etc but it still claims that mantle. Whereas you have then a, 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 mandate, a French mandate state, mandatory state that is also introducing a new configuration of uh, how these you know, Muslim communities, Christian communities, and of uh, Jewish communities, various minorities in Lebanon exist. So they have a very different relationship to religion. 
because they, you know, they have a secular configuration in ways that the Ottoman state did not. And so they are trying to, um, so that's also why the meaning of Waqf can only change if, you know, if the state considers part of its public interest and Islamic public interest is very different from um, um, a Lebanese state that is actually interested in a certain nation's public uh, interest that actually is uh, sometimes in contradiction with these various communities' uh, public interest or interest. And so, so that's why, you, you know, um, that's what I call the architecture, because I think there's a certain solidity to it. It makes sense in terms yeah. of, you know, um, the fact that I'm talking about a state. I don't want to call it like a language game, because really that's not, you know, I'm, I'm also taking it out of philosophy and moving it into a social historical kind of context. And so I, I felt like architecture would be a better place for it. So is it fair to say that architecture, I mean, I'm almost paraphrasing, um, it foregrounds the materiality of some of the changes that lead to different uses of concepts, right? right? So different grammars, exactly. you know, so exactly. you're bringing that kind of political, economic history, the changing sort of political topographies that we've seen exactly. from the beginning of the 19th century up until the 20th century um, into the story of how um, the grammar of concepts trans transforms. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So that's partly, you know, and I've had, you know, I've had people ask me, oh, what is, you know, um, grammar uh, and architecture, are they uh, structure and tahol, you know? And I'm like, no, this is very different because, you know, it's not that one is stable and the other one is changing. Both are changing. You know, the architecture changes as well as uh, the thing. And, and one is not, you know, uh, yeah, they, they're not kind of, uh, how do I say, like, yeah, it's okay. I don't to tell you. <laughs> Maybe one doesn't have primacy, is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, so, yeah, and it's also not about the same, you know, one is more contextual, I would say, rather than dictating the same, uh, 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 the same kind of uh, action. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So perhaps to come back, to, since we brought up Maslaha and, you know, <laughs> the interest, I would say that, um, um, before I say that, I just want to say thank you for the questions because I feel like it's so nice for you know an author to feel like people have read and are you know <laughs> your book. It's really you write and you never know who ever reads it and if anybody reads it. <laughs> so, so it's really kind of you know thank you so much for thinking with me and you know it helps me also see what's clear, what's not clear, and you know clarity is as as an important goal for me. <laughs> And I, I did tell Henny that I, you know, I feel like my book also is new, so it interferes in uh, debates that have been going on for a while. And so partly, of course, it's harder to get to if you are a novice in a field. So I, I will blame it also on that, not just on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, I will say regarding Maslaha that um, the way I see it operating in, in with regards to the Waqf is that in fact, the modernization of Waqf and its kind of attempt to kind of putting it in the, in the economy is not done within the Islamic tradition using Maslaha. Mm -hmm. So that's very different from the way, for example, Wa'al Halaq talks about the way Maslaha has been used basically to kind of dilute the Islamic tradition to any kind of needs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, of the state, you know, like what happens in Iran and just becomes, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, state reasons uh, kind of forcing kind of changes <laughs> to the tradition and to the, what are the opinions that are should be dominant etc so that's why in fact the it's, it, the waqf is interesting because they were using though uh, arguments from within the tradition and they were making uh, you know methodological uh, um, uh, uh, methodolo so methodologically they are not using public interest as a methodology mm -hmm. to f to dismiss family wealth. Mm -hmm. They are, however, trying to make particular arguments about why uh, f the family wealth itself has to be, you know, uh, gotten rid of. And that comes in, they use actually arguments from economic theory, and so that's where I try to say that within the Islamic tradition, you start to see people using 
kinds of proofs that were not used before, which are you know uh, economic uh, and and that were not used were not necessarily used before, and so you can see how they are partly you know, drawn into the economic sciences as uh, authoritative discourse that you can use in the tradition to make arguments. Uh, but it is not necessarily, you know, about maslaha is what I'd say. And so the question of maslaha arises is in, in, in the, for the Ottomans when people are telling them, well, you know, you're supposed to be doing the maslaha of the Muslim community, but then you are doing all these things to the wall. So how does that work together? You know, you're supposed to and so there's these two tensions and what I have found, and I think there's definitely more space to do more research on that, is that the, the particular case I work with, it ends up being kind of resolved through procedure and they don't actually address the question of these bigger reasons of state, say opening up new roads, et cetera, versus walks. I mean, the new roads is easier because it's it's actually given in the Islamic legal tradition. So that exists as a tradition, as an, as an example that you can open destroy a road for, uh, uh, you can destroy, sorry, a shop or something for a uh, road, but you know, uh, larger projects of urban redevelopment. Um, put these two uh, interests against each other and they are not actually resolved uh, saying, well, you know, the state has to do something here. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I would say to that. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, um, okay, so I did that. And so we can also open up to. Yeah. Do you sure. That There's the we... question of intent and uh, oh, the yes, role of family. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the question of intent. Um, so for those who might have not read this, so there's a chapter in the book that actually looks at um, what I call the, you know, the changing notion of intent that is and the intent of charity, the requirement of the intent of charity and how we know it. And what I say is that in, in all the court records I had seen in, you know, in Beirut, there was no challenge of waqf based on its intent. People saying, oh, the, you know, not us doing a waqf really, it's supposed to be for charity, but it's actually done for her to um, escape taxes or to, pro to kind of, you know, do other things. So the questioning, uh, the explicit questioning of the intent is not done, partly because judges cannot know intent except through actions. And so if you have, you know, if you do something, you know, uh, if you are, um, if you have done all what is legally required of a walk, your intent is not going to be questioned. So because, you know, think about it, then you can, people can just throw accusations of intent and, and that's not, you know, going to be okay. So. Um, as long as you are uh, fulfilling all the legal requirements, the question of intent doesn't arise because how are you really going to know somebody's real intent that's left to God in the hereafter, you know. Um, and so that is, but then what I encountered in the Ottoman archive was particularly from the Ottoman governor in Lebanon uh, asking about people doing what with the escape, attempt to escape um, foreclosures and so um, so I tried to say okay what does that what's happening here why is, are we talking about the intent of, uh, of, of what founders all of a sudden and part of what I do is then you know uh, argue that it's a changing debt regime whereby now foreclosures are much more common than they were in the kind of legal regime that the Islamic legal regime that existed before um, that have made um, walks more suspicious because now they can be used much more to escape foreclosures in ways that because foreclosure has become so common and um, and and so what I argue is that there's these changes in the economy that are also affecting the way we think of interiority and the way we think of uh, you know uh, how how we can know people's intent, how, you know, and, and render certain actions more suspicious. And, um, and, and that suspicion is not something that perhaps existed as much before uh, or was left to God. There's all of, also I discussed some of these injunctions against guesswork in terms of people's intents that are in the Islamic tradition, that you're not supposed to be doing guesswork of people's intentions. <laughs> 
uh, gossip and things of the sort. Um, not encouraged, <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, so, so the place of that chapter in my general narrative comes around the way um, you know I looked at, at the different changes in the conceptions of charity. So I'm moving, you know, that that these bigger changes in religion and and economy have also effects on the individual and and, and so not so and conceptions of the, the the community the family the role of the family etc and and in the state as well so i kind of have each chapter you know going from the more um from the individual to a bigger to the family and then eventually to the community more more broadly so that's really what it's the way it's kind of worked out in the in the book <laughs> um, and finally regarding family wolves i will tell you that family wolves have almost been eradicated i mean so i i i actually told uh john michael earlier that in fact when i started doing the research i discovered that my family has a wolf and I was like, how, how come I've never heard of this? <laughs> and they are also in lawsuits against, you know, the director general of Islamic Wolves. There's all of these things that, you know, the older women in my family took care of and fought about. And so, of course, they didn't tell us about it as children. And so I never knew about it. And so, but in fact, part of what the French legislation did was to make and encourage people to get rid of all of these family wolves and try and you know bring them back into circulation and so they incur all people most people actually uh just divided the you know they kind of uh they, they you can do a, a procedure of transforming walks back into private property where here the family beneficiaries or the heirs will actually become the the owners and you er there's no more walk and so there was maybe a the ones that I can know that I know about, there's a few of them that remain, but most of them actually have been eradicated. And so, in fact, these relations that they sustain don't exist anymore. You know, so today is it's quite different. And even the intent of Purba, uh, which you know, which is to get closer to God, is very much obscured um, because. A lot of them are administered by the director, at Wokf, a director general of Islamic Wakf. So most of these Wakf originally were administered by individuals, but then the modern state started to interfere from the Ottomans, trying to say, "Oh, these are not well administered. We have to take care of them. This administrator died. We will administer them ourselves." So, and until today, when <laughs> like I am so suspicious, suspicious of the DGIW, because the director general of Islamic Wakf because they could they would ask me things when I'm doing my research I'm like oh yeah like you should you know try to make them this family to um what do you say uh let them they don't have an administrator right now you should help them get an administrator let them find an administrator and I start to think suspiciously that it's partly that they want to take over the wolf but without an, of like of the family agreeing on who is the administrator they won't be able to do so <laughs> so they really want to take over a lot of them uh, and, and because of course it's a lot of wealth, a lot of money, and sometimes okay, it's true families don't get along, like my family, about what they wanted to do with it, and and so it's sitting there idle, but it's you know not the DIW taking it and doing unknown things with it. I mean, they are supposedly you know helping staff mosques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but there's a lot of uh, suspicion towards the director general of Islamic Wolf because there's a lot of money involved. And because they're not transparent about it, and that's a huge issue. And you know, there's all of this money from the Muslim that the Muslim community considers entrusted to that entity that just is not trustworthy <laughs> for them. I mean, that's usually the critique in, in among uh, Muslim kind of various Muslim groups. And so, yeah. So basically, the DJIW only uses the the director general doesn't follow anymore the. The, the stipulations of founders, and they just do whatever they want with the money, what they consider necessary for the according to their budget. So yes, the Qurba is kind of separated almost, like it's kind of now served general Muslim interests. That's how it has become formulated, 
even though I will tell you that sometimes Muslims will tell you, like, you know, or certain ex-family walks, etc., that comes up as, as, as a, when the DJIW does something they shouldn't be doing, selling something, walks and things of the sort, people bring up the fact that, you know, this is, you know, my ancestors' walks, they're supposed to be a rewards for this, and they're kind of just throwing it all to the, you know, to, to the sea, you know, it's it's kind of, they don't care about it. So that comes up sometimes, but, you know, as I said, there's a few of these, not so many of these family walks, and, um, yeah, so. Great, yeah. thank you. So I think we can open up to the audience. Maybe we'll take a handful of questions um, to kind of get ideas flowing and a discussion going. Um, and maybe we can just take lots of notes and I answer them all, all at once. Um, so person over here, please. Thank you. And feel free also to introduce yourselves if you'd like as well. Um, another question? Yep, in front. Thank you. Um, curious to find out what the reaction of the ulama at the time was when the French started meddling around with the idea of what and trying to sort of superimpose capitalism upon it. Was there division between them also between the ulama that the French used to sort of you know, give religious justification to it? Was there division and split? How did that also impact the Muslim community that followed those ulama? Was the, uh, you know, were they, what happened in that instance? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, please, please forgive me if like this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> a lot, a lot of like the linguistic stuff that you guys were talking about was like going like way into my head. Yeah. Um, but it, this was like super interesting in terms of like the convergence between um, economics, politics, and religion, and what role religion plays within uh, modern day contemporary society and, and such and so forth. So. I just wanted to ask about like the intersection and coexistence between Islam and capitalism, because as far as I see it, it's like the the what? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Mm -hmm. Wolf. Yeah. Oh, it has wolf. an F. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, the wolf um, is like the way I interpret it. It's like an economic practice um, within the Islamic theological worldview and civilization, which suggests that Islam. As a religion is in opposition to the sort of like neoclassical notion of like the invisible hand. I also, I also found it like really interesting that you mentioned how the invisible hand um, is almost perceived to be like a kind of god in a sense, mm -hmm. um, and and the way that the sort of like international community is like just <coughs> like bows down to this like unquestionable like the unquestionable orthodoxies of the free market is like it does seem like. A religion at times, um, or like a kind of God, um, a metaphysical thing. Present, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, a society which is like ruled by market forces um, seems to be at odds with the, the like ontological world that Islam cultivates and creates, um, where Muslims are 
very much conscious of, of, of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and like everything is revolving around um, the, the supernatural being. Um, and that fundamentally creates like a different kind of citizen, um, a citizen which is, is, is conscious of more than just like the pursuit of self-interest and, and, and profit. Sorry, I'll get a couple, just a couple more hands. So person in the middle there, please. Um, so I really had a very shallow understanding and knowledge about uh, what, and uh, I was even less. I was even less aware that it was just uh, that it was not just Islam. And so, if we look at what I said, you, you mentioned it in the in the chapter a bunch of times. But if you look at them as institutions and also social movements, in terms of religious <coughs> conflicts in Lebanon, I was also wondering if it if it had any factors to do with these conflicts, uh, the different what some different religions. Mm -hmm. That. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to try and ask it as well as I can. But if we kind of accept that intent can be like talk about trust or something else, um, and one of the examples I was thinking of that is for Naomi's work in the Lady Kara, like in Massachusetts, for example, it very much like looks at economic factors plus sort of a Roman influence in that family. Mm -hmm. To what extent can we read like today, for example, like the founding of NGO as reflective of that same logic? So you've got Cordoba, but you also have like this uh, economic environment that you know makes it easy to put like a foreign investor involved in that NGO. Um, so to what extent can we see that that is actually mixing again the religious and economic spheres that have been separated over time? Um, can you get a little bit of time to speak? Um, yeah, you done? But just elevate your voice here. Yeah. The first question is what we have discussed discussed in this seminar, like um, in your lifestyle, you have like more uh, take order, like create, create more, so called create more than Ottoman Empire, and then late Ottoman Empire, and then the French mandate payroll and the post colonial payroll, and all five chapters were the same to the structure. Yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. And actually, in class, while we were discussing this, we were kind of very curious about how you will view like elements of the colonial mm -hmm. in this kind of the tradition of the very very concept uh, battle because like what we have learned from our class like the classical monograph about the field like the issues of colonizing Egypt mm -hmm. kind of monograph all refers to the very importance of the very central position of colonial in such kind of transition, like what is the modern states. So that is what we want to ask about the your consideration into mm -hmm. this kind of right to style. And also, I, 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 have two, I have two questions. And the other one is my personal question. So you have given three key terms related to the so-called transition of battle, like the Secular rate and also the privatization. And also, the last one is what I want to ask more about is like the sectarianization. Because, like, uh, it has been a long time when we think about the Netherlands, we were thinking about like this uh, progression and this development <coughs> of the different sects. Mm -hmm. And, like, uh, currently, the new research has challenged the conventional research, saying that no, the right, the phenomena of the sectarianization is not a long time pre modern rivalry between like the Mount Lebanese or Monites. It's like a phenomenon emerged with the colonial modernity. Mm -hmm. So, with the your research, like concerning the sectarianization of the battle, how could we like complex or give new insights about this kind of phenomenon in Lebanon? Maybe in the historical period, also maybe in the contemporary politics. Yes, this is my yeah. question. Wonderful, thank, thank you so you. much. I'm just gonna uh, just add to your first question. Oh, sorry, because sorry, <laughs> final one, I promise I'm gonna abuse, abuse my, um, 
position, but just the, on the question of the colonial, so you done very nicely sort of laid out the structure of your, your, your chapters. So what we, you know, for, for ease mostly we call sort of pre, pre-modern or early Ottoman approaches to work, then the late Ottoman, French mandate, and then colonial. So one of the things we were just, post-colonial. sorry, post-colonial, yeah. colonial, post-colonial. Um, <laughs> it seemed to us that in some ways you were stressing the French mandate period as the major sort of epistemic rupture. However, when we were reading the text, it seemed to be the late Ottoman period that appeared to be the more important transition. Um, if that's the case, what does that do to our understanding of colonialism? Um, and to just put it in the most sort of um, kind of blunt and um, brutal way, are we seeing something of the colonial in the late Ottoman Empire in the way um, we see transformations of, of selfhood, yeah. understandings of intent, um, the, you know, the, the yeah. production of these different domains of the economic and the religious? You know, what is your stance on the colonial? Yeah. So you don't have to answer, I think, yeah. all of these, yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. pick up I'll on pick a few things, strands. but I, I want to say, I mean, I think there's a historiographic question first, I would say, like, you know, um, that division also. And what is the post-colonial, for example, in the case of Lebanon, which I actually kind of treat as the moment of really change is a lot of the times 1990. <laughs> so we are still in the colonial almost like logics until 1990 when there's some changes that happen. So I think, you know, some of the, in Waqf at least. So I think there's something interesting happening, uh, you know, there that I don't elaborate on because I'm not so much of a historian. <laughs> uh, but that is really kind of, I think, a part of the intervention. And the other intervention indeed talks back to these literatures that have spoken of the Ottoman Empire as possibly a call as having doing internal colonization, talking about their relationship to Arabs, which I am a bit more suspicious of. So I would say that's where I stand. And I think that what I am talking about is the a modern governmentality. And that's why that I treat, see that with the early, like, you know, 19th century Ottoman as the main time of these new ideas of the economy that arise. And, and of course, I mean, you know, this is a, a lot of Foucault here, but it, it, is, it is what it is. Uh, but I, I definitely see these discourses about the economy, about, you know, the administration, you know, uh, the well administration of these, you know, walks, etc., as echoing uh, these, you know, governmental kind of discourses. And so that's where I see that and it's true that I fought quite a bit on you know, the fact that I put less emphasis on the colonial as such, mm-hmm. uh, as, as that kind of, you know, uh, uh, I, mean, I remember very much a WAF conference when I was beginning my research, and I got into a, a, an argument with a historian of the Lebanon about the fact that he didn't put enough emphasis on how much the French colonial <laughs> introduced the rupture. And I, I still think that the French colonial introduced the rupture because they refigured the architecture of the state. And I think that is the huge difference that, int- that, is, that introduces communities as these sects that are have legal sovereignty that I think is quite different from the Ottoman. And I think that's where I, I see still an importance to the colonial, despite the fact that it's not, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, the, the Ottomans were trying to raise more revenues to actually, you know, arrange the economy in certain ways to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, to, to raise more, whether taxes or, uh, you know, even walk, I mean, appropriating walk revenues is quite, you know, a huge step that they, they do. And so I, I definitely, that's how I see it. And I hope that's, is that good? Yeah, does that help? Um, and, you know, thank you so much for, you know, they're all amazing questions, and I want to answer all of them, but I will just do what, I mean, this question of the transit, I like the, the way you frame it, that I talk about as on secularization, privatization, sectarianization of the wealth. And I see secularization as the big term, and part of it is privatization and sectarianization, because I see sectarianization as part of the secular configuration of Lebanon. So the transformation of, you know, the, the, the relationship of, uh, law and religion in Lebanon is very much uh, a secular configuration because you have these you know different communities and they have each their kind of uh, you know their there's a, like a you know um, 
each has its own kind of uh, laws, and the state is equally distant from all of them to a certain degree. And so that is a secular configuration. And of course, it adds to the fact that this is not just, you know, a sectarian, you know, the sect is not something that has always pre-existed. And, um, and just to, to people who are thinking that, you know, of course, the Ottomans had the millet, you know, why is that? A lot of people would tell you that the millet, you know, these sectarianism is a continuation of the millet system. But in fact, it ha operates according to very different logics. And I'm stealing from Deja Abilana's work, <laughs> just to be honest. And he actually makes the argument that the Ottoman gives, the way the Ottoman gives these corporate, um, uh, you know, uh, advantages or whatever you want to call them to certain communities is not a, is a matter of privilege that can be revoked. Whereas in the modern state, that is not how it is in the modern like secular state. That's how the state operates. Whereas you have a sovereign who might you know give certain communities they can petition to be kind of, and it's the sovereign that decides on the, on it. Whereas in in Lebanon, that is totally not how it works. It's supposed to be, you know, it's it's the architecture of the state that they exist. This the, it is conceived of as these different communities, and so. I would say it reconfigures um, these, you know, millets quite differently. And um, and regarding, um, you know, um, there's a bunch of things I want to say. Um, so uh, I'm going to go backwards. <laughs> so the NGOs, for example, uh, I, I, what's interesting about the NGOs, WOFs, is that they, in fact, a lot of them don't do any property. So a lot of them are just, you know, a, a kind of a, any NGO and they raise funds. So basically they are doing what WOF is supposed to help you not do, which is because, you know, with WOF usually you have all these endowed land that actually brings you all of this money. And so and, and on the other hand, these NGO WOFs are actually doing like any NGO, which is, you know, constantly trying to raise money. So I would say they are quite, they operate quite differently from the original WOFs. Um, and um, um, now the question of Islam and capitalism, <laughs> I think I'm, even though I want to, you know, believe that, uh, you know, believing in God and, you know, and that there's another world that we have responsibilities towards the community, etc., it can be interpreted in so many ways, some of which are very neoliberal and some of which are actually much more radical. So what I want to say, I don't think that the Islamic tradition would provide a blueprint for something that's more necessarily socialist or something, you know. And I think it can be put to use to, to a variety of, of, of ways. And you can see that with proponents of Islamic finance, some of which reject completely, you know, the world system and some of which are completely operating within it. Now, what I do think, however, is that there are certain frictions and it's not just you know it's now Islam has just become neoliberal and that's it and we can just and I think as you say the fact that there is you know a, a hereafter brings in very different calculations for people in their lives and I think that's something that still comes up sometimes and you know does not really make it just easily put into, okay, now Islam is neoliberalism and that's it. Um, I, I think things are a bit more complex than that. And and so, yes, of course, you know, yeah, so I, that's what I, I would say is that, yeah, it's, I I would have loved for it to be the case. And there were, they, you know, there's a bunch of Muslim, you know, uh, Turkish, uh, you know, uh, radical kind of uh, Marxist thinkers, and, you know, that are, you know, interested in, you know, trying to think about it. But you also have those who, for example, uh, uh, Daromir Rudinsky has studied uh, uh, in, I always forget his site, Indonesia. He, he, he did work in Indonesia with these, you know, institutions that are just about instilling neoliberal subjectivities among Muslims. I like, you know, all of ideas of accountability and that are very much in the frame of uh, neoliberal subjectivity. And then also Munazia did, did similar work in Egypt. 
with the new features. And so, yeah, you, uh, so I think that, uh, like, yeah, Amr Khalid, and I think that's the person she worked with. And, and they are very near mural. <laughs> and I, what I want to say is that in Beirut, when I was looking at the wafts of the, the Director General of Islamic Wafts in Saudi there, part of what they do is they resist their expropriation. By it. So they're trying to actually remain owners in the city center when the city center had been trying to be financialized. So what happened is after the reconstruction, people, uh, you know, there was a reconstruction company that decided there was, it's, it's a very debatable thing. I, I can't go into the details right now. It's like, big, you know, a huge political deal. But eventually there was a real estate company that gave every single owner in the city center shares instead of their property. So imagine, not even compensation in cash. You just are receiving share from a company that hopefully will they one day make money. So it just like was a big theft, basically. And everybody almost was expropriated. And the WAPs at first went along, and then there was a big mobilization among the Muslim community, like, oh, WAPs, you can't sell them, etc. Eventually, they got some WAPs back. But the way they did it was actually by selling some of them and returning some others. And so basically, and they also were very happy with some of the expropriations that this, the, the company did, which is it got rid of all of their tenants, and the tenants had to were paying rent stabilized rents. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, so they kind of are participating in this neoliberal, you know, project. They're happy to take part of it, partly, but at the same time, they are also then producing walks that are themselves not really very good for just you know turning around into property and selling it and you know doing that kind of stuff. So. That's why there's, I think, there's tension even among property, like you know, uh, yeah, even in walks that are inalienable, etc. So, so I think it's a bit complicated. Um, is is really what I like to always say. It's complicated. <laughs> there's no easy answer. Um, now, regarding uh, I, uh, the religion, the question of conflicts and uh, walks and sect, I will address that with uh, another uh, question, which was about it too. Where is Jewish it? and Christian. Oh, the Jewish walks. and Christian walks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a huge, uh, you know, I think perhaps the richest walks in Lebanon are the Maronite walks in Mount Lebanon, not the Sunni walks, even though, uh, you know, they do have some in, in, in Beirut, even though yeah, I, that's my own kind of assessment from what I have seen, because I've seen the Sunni walks, uh, and and they're you know not very rich, and particularly at this moment, whatever they had in the banks has disappeared <laughs> because of you know of the financial crisis, which is like horrendous. But still, you know, and so if you're rich in land, you're in a better place at this point, and the Mount Lebanon kind of is full of walks. Uh, uh, so anyway. Um, and so definitely other communities were doing walks and, you know, they're, you know, but as I said, I think the difference is that a lot of the walks were done as individual endeavors that were very much done for a particular community that one was part of. And these communities were very much at the level of the city or at the level of a neighborhood or at the level of a family. So it was not like this is, you know, for the larger, you know, of course there's like the ummah. I mean, there's always, you know, Muslims sometimes do them for the poor of Mecca and Medina. But that is a very different imaginary from one that is bound to a nation state of which you are a part. And I think these, you know, imaginaries existed, but they, they, quite, they operated not quite the same as these sects within uh, a state. Um, and, and so that's why I think that today, regarding the wolves and the way they come into co conflicts, I don't think that's, um, I think what you see, there's actually interesting politics around it because the religious leadership and the political religious leadership are quite different. You know, and I think that's, they are sometimes intentions, sometimes not. And I think that's actually can be productive <laughs> for those who are in, interested in wealth. And one of the things that happened in the reconstruction is the way uh, the religious leadership and the political leadership were sometimes in cahoots. But then eventually they had actually kind of fell, fell apart because of political reasons. 
and how Muslims mobilized the from the grassroots notions of what set the religious community, you know, uh, trustees were not using to go against the sectarianism, which is the kind of the, the political and religious uh, uh, leaders leadership coming in, in into cahoots. So I think there's because of the way the religious and political uh, are separate, like leaderships are separate and can come together sometimes and or not. I think there's more space. It's not just as uh, you know that the walks are necessarily reproducing these. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think they reproduce sectarian identities because people now talk about the wakfs of the Muslim community, the wakfs, etc. So it definitely reproduces identifications of people now as subjects in communities rather than, say, the state more broadly. So I think in some ways it does, but in, it, it is not... Uh, I, yeah, I don't think that the wakfs are funding jihad Sorry, like the way they did in Nigeria, or like you know, they're not. They don't have so much money to kind of be to be using it to kind of you know uh, fund uh, arming you know the future party. <laughs> I don't think that's happening. Um, yeah, I think you need much more money than they can provide. <laughs> um, and what else? Um, the reaction of the ulama uh, and, and the way the French were, so I think these I will do together, the relationship of, uh, of the ulama to, to these uh, French attempts. Part of what I do in, in, in an article, which is kind of an expansion of one of the chapters, is to look at, in particular, the divisions among the ulama. And, uh, and, and the way, the usual explanation is that there's like an old guard ulama who are much more in line with uh, say the the administration and who are going along, and then there's ones that come from a much more poorer background who are not interested in, in you know uh, in 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 wafs. And so the older guard ulama are the ones who are benefiting from family wafs. And then you can see that the uh, and and then the other ones who are much more poorer and they don't have these older money com coming to them, uh, they they come in. Uh, they, they come to, to head and basically th those are the reformists are the ones who are you know coming from these particular backgrounds and the other ones have these class interests in letting the family walks continue um, but um, what I show is that in fact you can't make that division that in fact there are reformists among the old guard and then there are people who defended the family walks among that and what I argue instead is that what is happening is that there are some ulama who are kind of interpolated by notions of progress. That the idea of, you know, we have to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that these walks are well developed, etc. And they start to think more of the, the family walks as kind of, you know, not really religious. And they kind of, you know, they, they go back particularly to certain uh, earlier in kind of interpretations uh, and, and um, and then uh, to, to dismiss them. So I think that both the, the, these reformist talama are basically drawn by these modern ideas of development more than anything else. And that's why they are kind of working with the French. Uh, and so in some ways, it's, it's you know, they, they believe that what they're doing is right. And it's not that, you know, they're so sellouts, I would say. Um, and and how, I mean, and that I think answers your question is that some of them were interpolated by these arguments that, you know, the family wolf is not truly a wolf and therefore went with the French when they were trying to do some reforms. But I will tell you, it is such a political act that in fact, it was not in Lebanon and Syria, the law that prohibits or like limits family wolves to two generations, which is a big change for uh, you know family walks because they are I mean walks in general because it's eternal supposedly now they promulgated a law but it only passed after the French left because of this issue of interference 
So because if the French had passed it, it would be like the French are interfering in the Muslim affairs. What are they doing? Whereas if Muslims do it to themselves, then it's okay. <laughs> you know, I think you have seen even you know uh, in Egypt the nationalization of all of the walks that Nasser did. It's not like you know unheard of that you know governments would actually interfere in walks. Uh, there's even narratives of Muhammad Ali, you know, getting rid of all of these walks, etc. And so. I think uh, governments, you know, had reasons to interfere and could use of reasons of state to do that, even earlier. And and I, I want to say again, I, I like, yeah, like there are ideas of development that a lot of Muslim scholars kind of were interpolated by, and that actually that helped them get into on the same line as the. French colonial reforms, and, and it's not because just interests and, and things of the sort. I think that's, 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 that's a it. good round. Okay, yeah. so uh, open up for There's another round rounds. of, whoa, I think, do we have got yes. a couple of minutes, but last round of uh, questions, comments, yes, um, in front of yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just wondering, because we know that what is uh, cannot be sold or taken, you know, by the step. But is there any test maybe in the late Ottoman period of Levant or the French mandate or the post colonial reconfiscation of the war in order to, you know, for the sake of Muslim for it, for instance? Just wondering what that is. Is it hand at the back? Yep. Um, yeah, um, I want to kind of go back uh, to uh, Henny's uh, question about periodization and about. How do you think about um, um, colonialism in light of uh, the fact that you know a lot of these transformations actually started in the late uh, Ottoman uh, period? You mentioned that uh, you know, the master concept that you're working with is secularization, right? Uh, but in, in your answers, it sounded like the master concept is really modernization, and secularization is more of an effect. Uh, so, you know, the ulama who are interpolated by ideas of progress kind of, you know, partake in this, you know, reform of what we're not, uh, I would assume, kind of engaging in a, in, a, in a project of secularization, but in a project of modernization, whereas the effect might be um, secularization. So I, I, I can totally see where you're coming from, kind of thinking about the grammar of these uh, concepts, right? And, you know, the grammar uh, is, a, is a grammar of secularization, but as a project, as a political project, it's a project of modernization. So just to kind of like think about uh, what modernization is doing in relation to you know, colonialism uh, as, a, as a process, uh, rather than uh, you know, colonialism as just Position. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We had a question here. Yeah. Um, so much more basic one. Uh, Can you raise your voice? A uh, much more basic question. Um, the role of the administrator. You know, you talk about how the general doesn't fully own it. They appoint the administrator. You mentioned the sort of rise of the directorate of Islamic walks. I was just wondering, uh, did the role, the powers that were afforded to the administrator, change over those periods, or was it something that remained relatively static? Okay. Maybe. Oh, sorry, we've got lots in the corner here. Sarah? Um, hi, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, Can you also, also raise your voice just a little bit? Yeah, um, just saying thank you very much for the for being here today and this amazing conversation. Um, also wanted to say that my students in the political economy class are also reading your book today, so you have a lot of SOAS readers <laughs> this week. Um, I guess my question is, I'm just fascinated by this concept of the walk of becoming a moral person. Um, and I guess I want to think about it in conjunction with other transformations um, in how we conceive of personhood in a capitalist kind of um, economy, and especially of uh, the ways in which, for example, corporations develop, you know, particular notions of personhood. Um, and I guess it's kind of a little bit of a self-interested question because I'm also thinking like in my book about buildings um, and the kind of personhood they, you know, um, develop over time. Um, and I guess my, 
what I'm trying to push for is kind of a conversation about how do we think about the place of, I guess, you know, we talk about a very human-centric notion um, of these kind of ideas around capitalism and rights and so on. But it seems like a lot of non-human agents get a lot of rights in, these, in, a, in a project of a capitalist accumulation. I guess I kind of just wanted to see your, you know, hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Sorry, I overlooked the hand over here. Yeah, yeah um, so uh, thank you again uh, for uh, your talk. Uh, I had a question regarding the family law. Mm -hmm. um, because you said, like, uh, according to law and legislation, there is, like, the family law, and then the other, like, for charitable reason. And I wanted to ask why um, the, the, the reasons for um, the French or uh, to, to, to target exactly the family laws, but not the other ones. Like, was it only the, the, the beneficiaries, or was it also maybe other reason for, like, I don't know, the quantity maybe of blocks in uh, Lebanon, uh, or was it, I don't know, the, the amount of wealth uh, within? Okay. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm right in the, oh, just one more, and then I think we're going to have to, <laughs> going to leave the room very quickly, two minutes before seven, but yeah. I'm just thinking about the current um, political and economic implosion in Lebanon and in the wake of the Felda. How can thinking about the law potentially as a commons or something else, as you had mentioned briefly in your book, sort of maybe guide us a little bit um, in this moment? Okay, sorry. I'm 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 going to just abuse my position as the chair to <laughs> ask, question. ask a question that I think maybe hopefully speaks to some of the the broader um, discussions we're going to be having over the course of this term. So um, one thing that was so present in in the book, um, and which we've touched on a little bit, um, was debt. Right. So not just debt at the as, at the individual level as a way of circumventing the waqf and it is this you know a well-intentioned waqf but the, the situation of indebtedness that obviously existed in the late 19th century Ottoman Empire but also we know Ottoman Egypt and the Qajar spaces um, so I was wondering um, is there a very different story of capitalism or, or capital accumulation that we can sort of draw um, from, from your book and could you sort of um, speak to that a, a little and, and more towards the question of sort of um, you know provincializing some of the concepts that we use in, in political economy, why should we as students of um, you know, the history of capitalism at SOAS, starting from the global south, why should we pay attention to the concepts coming out of FIP, jurisprudence, Islamic law? What, what do they offer us? Um, because I mean, in, a, in a talk I was giving recently, I got a provocative question in the audience um, to the effect that, well, isn't this all just a history of capitalism? You know, don't we know the outcome of this even before we've read, read the text? And my, my suspicion is that the answer to that is no. Um, and then secondly, um, specifically about the work, um, can we make a kind of general statement? I mean, you've done this kind of amazing piece of research about the transfiguration of the work um, as being one of the central um, kind of moments, right? A kind of moment of um, maybe downfall or epistemic transformation that leads to the birth of colonial modernity in the space that we're looking at. In other words, how central is the work in the story of political economic transformation in the Ottoman Empire um, as a whole? If you could make a general sort of comment on that. In, um, in, in, <laughs> in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you pick and choose, you know. Yeah. Um, I feel like they are enormous questions, and I don't have answers that are going to be satisfactory at all. So I'll, I'll just th say, say that. And um, particularly, perhaps, the question of provincializing uh, concepts, and, uh, you know, I, I do think, you know, that particularly what it gives us is a way to think through similarity and difference. And I think it is just, it, it kind of destabilizes. I mean, I, I have so, in fact, I had people tell me that I am exoticizing the Islamic tradition by saying waqf instead of just using endowment and trust. And so that's where I'm like, no, I'm an anthropologist. I mean, 
if it was the same concept, I would not be using the same word. I mean, it, there's definitely something about the walk that's quite different, which is this question of kurva, which is being close to God. And I think if you use trust, you are erasing that by making it too familiar. So in fact, I want to hold on to that distinction, you know, because I think it is important. And I think these different kind of traditions think about religion, I mean, that and um, all these property relations. I mean, same thing with milk. Like, is milk just private property? I don't think so. You know, so I think we need to hold on to these if we actually want to decenter capitalism and not just take for granted its categories and say, oh yeah, we also had this, you know, like, I am not going to do this, you know. Yeah. You know, we also had private property, we also had, you know, all of these things, and in fact, Islam can be just as easily, you know, rendered into uh, these languages and just become, oh yeah, you know, I mean, the that's the whole, like, problematic of uh, um, Timur Quran, like, why didn't we become them since yeah. we have these, you know, like, or what stood in the way of us becoming them? And I, I think that's not really what I'm interested in as a project, and I'm interested in actually destabilizing our concepts that we take for granted, so that's where I see that. Um, and in terms of uh, the um, the wealth as commons, I think that's an interesting, you know, question about where I see this project in relation to the contemporary moment. And I really am trying to excavate this alternative history because I think yes, we can make claims on these various uh, religious groups by reminding ourselves that a religious kind of corporations, sects, etc. That yes, there are other ways of thinking of them the way them the way they are doing it. And you can actually draw on that to try and you know make claims. And but this are these are claims that should be I think political. <laughs> and it is not something you're gonna fight for them. You're not gonna win the battle through law. It has to be through mobilization because that is the dominant kind of discourse right now. And so um, yeah. And uh, and the question of um, moral personhood is definitely something that I also am really interested in uh, regarding you know a human. You know, the, the, the fact that, yes, objects also acquire, uh, I mean, you know, these corporations now have so many rights in the U.S., for example, when you think about it, like, politically, etc. And I think that is definitely something uh, that when we think about human and non-human and think about, you know, all the non-human, like, this is destabilizing capitalism, but it does not necessarily always so because the way it, in capitalism you can give, you know, corporations all of these powers. So I don't know if that really answers uh, your question, but you know that that's where I see that. And um, to, the role of the administrator did change quite a bit, uh, and particularly because the walks became centralized with the with the director general of Islamic walks, which made them uh, then have more powers than they necessarily did because earlier they had to follow the stipulations of the founder, whereas nowadays they don't. And uh, regarding why the family walks were targeted, uh, I think it has to do particularly with the question of the family and the way it tied up wealth in these private networks. Mm -hmm. And rather than actually keeping them, quote unquote, on, on the market that are you know just more open to transaction. And I think that is why the family walk itself. Ritu Birla has a book called Stages of Capital where she talk, looks at this in India and with particularly with regard to the family corporation, and it, it's a great book. It's it's oh, I'm on video. <laughs> it's hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> so just as a as an aside, but it's a great book at the same time. So I found it very useful. Um, and to Yezen's question, um, periodization, uh, yes, uh, I think that. Definitely secularization is not the term they would be using. I totally agree, and I think that's what is the effect. Now, whether I would say that, you know, there's definitely a project of modern, you know, modernization, and it is a lot of the times framed as such, but I think it's more also a project of, you know, development. Like, this is really what they are, you know, about. It's kind of the growth, and that is really, you know, I think you can definitely say that this is that, but. I think the form it takes, particularly though around the growth of the economy, I think has in it a story of secularization because it has a story of the making of the economy as an object. 
separate from other things. So I think these are intertwined stories rather than just a side effect. That I think you can't tell that story of modernization without really looking at also at the making of the economy as a sphere. If that makes sense. You might have to. Yes. So I just want to say this for me this book was rich. It was rigorous and uncompromising um, in the best uh, way possible. I think really it's a book that needs to be studied, not not read. So thank you so much, Neda, for, for joining us today. And thank you, our um, student responders. Responders, it sounds like a first name thing. <laughs> that, uh, our student particip participants on, on the panel and everybody else. And um, if you would uh, prefer not to be recorded, please send us an email. We've um, put our email address on the board there. Feel free to follow us on Twitter as well. And we look forward to continuing some of these conversations um, in the coming weeks with you. So please join me in giving a round of applause to everyone.